Good morning. Uh, my name is Teddy Forfer, uh, missionary to the Philippines. Uh, this is my wife back here, Lagaya, and then my daughter-in-law was sitting beside her, Anna J, and then my son, Dave. Uh, we have seven children. Dave is our youngest child, and he, uh, he works for Pensacola Christian College, and so uh, glad they're with us this morning. Uh, I spent 12 years in the U.S. Marine Corps, grew up in East Texas, and went in the Marines right after high school, and then uh, met my wife while I was stationed over there. But in 1984, got out of the, the Marines, and we went over to the Philippines, started planting churches, evangelizing, but we have since started a children's home, taking children off the streets, and we've taken children off, uh, over 300 children we have raised now, and uh, they've... Uh, Got some that are preaching now. We have our own Bible school, and we train them, and we got a number of them that is in the ministry. But uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this morning. Appreciate this church. Appreciate your faithfulness and support and the prayers. Uh, we have a, a little over 50 children now, the most that we've ever had. And uh, my son-in-law, you've met, and my daughter, they're there right now. And I actually, their daughter, my granddaughter, is starting to work, and she's uh, doing a lot of work there, helping out. And so uh, my wife and I are planning on trying to make more fundraising trips now. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, I believe we could do so much more. There's 1.8 million children living on the streets. We have a, uh, uh, about 10 acres of a property that we we're building on, plus... We just recently, the Lord blessed that we were able to purchase another location that we transferred the girls all over. So we separate the boys and girls on two different compounds. And so a prayer request that we have, and we're hoping that this trip maybe the Lord will provide, that uh, we're having to trans uh, give the, uh, go pick the girls up every morning to bring them over for their devotion and then their school. And, uh, and then in the evening we take them back over to their, their quarters that they're staying at. And then plus, uh, and they're about three miles away. We don't have nothing but a flatbed truck that we're using. And, and they're all piled on, hanging on it, and we have crumbling. So we're looking at a vehicle that we can get and uh, that will, uh, so pray for, for that. But let's take our Bibles, if you would, and turn to Psalms 142, verse 4. And uh, I was saying that my wife are going to be, and I are going to be come here. Uh, I, I really would rather be there. I'm going to go back as, uh, as soon as I can get back, and then we'll come back over here. Uh, but what we're looking at, we're seeing a doctor in Pensacola. We're getting old, and they want us to see a doctor on a regular schedule. And so we'll come see the doctor when we fly in, and then we'll go travel some. And then when we get back, we'll see a doctor before we fly back. And so we'll we'll do that. And so pray for it as we do that. Because, you know, as we get older, I'm not sure how long we'll be able to do that even going back and forth. Uh, I don't know. I'll be able to do it. My wife is getting old, though. Uh, <laughs> Psalms 142, verse 4. It says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me. No man cared for my soul. You know, I was thinking about this verse, and I was thinking that there is a, a number of different groups of people that I believe that are crying out that that no man cared for my soul. And uh, I thought of three different groups I'd like to talk about, but I think that we probably could think of others. But we'll look at these three uh, this morning. But let's go to the Lord in word of prayer, and you pray with me and for me. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ that died on the old rugged cross for our sins. God, we thank you for our church. We thank you for our Christian brothers and sisters and the love that we have for one another. And God, we pray that you'll meet with us this morning. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will just move and stir upon our hearts. And God, I pray that you'll help me as the preacher this morning to bring this message in the power of the Holy Spirit. Give me the very words you would have me to say. And God, I pray that, Lord, as I speak from without, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will speak from within. Have your sweet way in our lives and our service. Now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Um, it says that no man cared for my soul. I, I believe the lost man 
today is crying out that no man cares for our soul. And I believe even more so today than ever before. Uh, it, and there's several things I think about that, has, that indicates uh, uh, some things about the church that uh, tends to show that uh, the lost man will be concerned that no man care for him. You know, uh, the church today uh, and a whole has a different philosophy uh, in time gone by. There was a time when we came to church to worship a holy God. And that's what we feel we come here and we worship a holy God. And, you know, I, I, I like reading the, the old books back in the Puritan days and, and the 1600s and 1700s or so. And, and you read this. But almost all the books, uh, either it's in the title or within the content, talks about purity and or holiness. Uh, today, that is mocked and laughed at. You know, you're too, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Or they call them holy rollers or legalistics and things. And uh, the, the church has become a playground with the music and the uh, activities and things. And, you know, when the preacher gets through preaching, he goes to the door to shake hands. And people go to meet him at the door and they're shaking hands. They say, Pastor, I enjoy that. Pastor, that was good. I enjoy that. As if that's what we come to church for, to enjoy. Or if they don't come to church next Sunday, you go by and the preacher goes to visit them at their home. And they say, well, we miss you Sunday. So, well, Pastor, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm not enjoying it. Uh, and we think today that church, you know, people are looking for churches with their family, their children, programs for their children. Uh, churches has two services. They have a service for the uh, young people with the music they like, and they have the uh, another service for the older people for the music they like. And uh, that's what we think church is, a place that we go to enjoy, a place that we like to go and, and fellowship and play games. Uh, there was a book that was been written some years ago and became very popular. Uh, it was, uh, I think it was called a, a, The Purpose Driven Church. And, and the idea or the purpose of the church, it said, was to reach the unchurched. And what the author did in that book, he went out and surveyed his town, went and said door to door to find out what the lost man would enjoy to come to church. And then he incorporated that and sort of having a church where the lost people can enjoy to come. And, and he gave the idea, and that's what today that people thinks the purpose of the church is a place that lost people can come and enjoy themselves. Uh, and, and what is happening is the lost people are not getting saved. The lost man is like crying out, no man careth for my soul, while Christians are playing church. Uh, not only that, but another thing that's happening in the church is that we're preaching a different gospel than we used to preach. Uh, you know, the used time, did you know, believe it or not, there was a time when preachers used the word repent in their sermons. They would talk about repenting. Well, you don't hear that. There are schools that actually are teaching against repentance. There's books that's been written, speakers that have spoke and are telling us, you know, the word repent is not in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the book that tells you mostly how to get saved. And they say that if repent's not in that book, then that means it wasn't important. It's not needful. Well, you know, the rapture is not in our Bible at all. But actually, the, the, it's there. We are caught up in the air. We hear a trumpet sound. We're caught up. And, and, and we have John. You have Jesus said, you must be born again. I mean, you need to change your life and be a completely new person. Uh, you'll see that uh, all through it, the... Uh, Whenever the, uh, the rich man that Jesus comes across and uh, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, well, obey the law. Keep all the laws and everything. He said, I've done that since I was young. He says, yes, you have. Now, Jesus said he had done it. But one thing you like, sell all your goods, everything you have, give it to the poor, and take up your cross and follow me. This man turned around and walked away and died and went to hell. Jesus didn't call him back and say, wait, wait, just a minute. Just give me Sunday morning or something. Or just give me a few hours. No, Jesus said that we are to give our lives completely to God. 100%. And, and so uh, this, uh, you know, we, we have a word. If people believe that salvation is like magic, you say some magic words. You bow your head, repeat these magical words after me, and then you're saved. And you're going to heaven. And how do they know they're saved? Because the soul winner told them that they were saved. I mean, they wanted the Holy Spirit telling them. And uh, 
I, I heard one, I went to one lecture, uh, a soul winning lecture, with a speaker was telling us how to win souls, and he says that once you show them whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you called upon the name of the Lord, right? So you're saved. Now, he said, what's going to happen is that you're going to leave here and you're going to go out next week and get you a beer and get, and get drunk or smoke some dope or something. And you're going to come across somebody and they're going to say, oh, you're not saved. You tell them to get away from you, old Slewfield. You're saved. The Bible says, who serves call upon the name of the Lord is saved. And that's what they're teaching people. Uh, that there is no uh, repentance or desire. And what people need to understand, and I, and I preach this a lot now, uh, and I preach it a lot in churches because they need to hear it, is that you need to repent. And they think that teaching repentance is works for salvation. Now, we understand. We're Baptists. And if one thing we know, we know you're saved by the grace of God. It's not a works, lest any man should boast. And we understand that. But repentance is not works. Repentance is that uh, I'm living as a natural man in sin. We, we drank, smoke, curse, steal, covet, greedy. This of our very nature. But some throughout, sometime in my life, the Holy Spirit begins to work on my life. I hear the gospel. I hear preaching. I start getting convicted. I don't like this life I'm living. It's the heartaches, the pain, the suffering, the misery. I don't want it no more. And I want to be delivered. I want to be saved from my sins. And so what I do is I turn from those sins. And I turn to Jesus Christ to deliver me from sins. When the angels announced the birth of Christ... They said his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. See, we, we tell people, you don't want to go to hell, do you? You want to go to heaven, right? Say these few words and you get to go to heaven. Jesus did not really come to save us from hell. You don't read that in the Bible. He didn't come to take us to heaven. Jesus came to save us from sin. They said that, don't think that I've come to call the righteous, but I've came to call sinners unto repentance. And so Jesus tells the Nicodemus, ye must be born again. That's what Jesus came for, to give us new life, to give us abundant life, a, a, a full life right now. And that's what happens. Repentance, I want that life. I'm not thinking about going to hell or going to uh, heaven. I'm thinking about right now. I want a better life. I want to be a child of God. And so I turn to Christ and I call upon him to save me. I'm not in hell, so I'm not asking to save me from hell. I am living a life of hell, of sin and misery, and I call on him to save me. And when we do that, people get saved 100% every time. I, I used to uh, follow this easy believer. I could go, when I was in the Marine Corps, I'd go in the barracks, uh, and I could go down the, uh, to room to room. I was a staff sergeant, and uh, uh, people listened to me. They, they showed polite and respect, so they would listen to me. And I could get the person to pray. And I'd get, uh, every person i come to, they would pray. And I'd get excited. I'd mark it down in my Bible. Another soul saved, another soul. But where really they started bothering me, they didn't come to church. Their life didn't change. There was nothing, they didn't have what I had when I got saved. And is it because that God lied? He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No, it wasn't them. It's that because they asked to be saved from the wrong thing. You see, if you fell out of an airplane and you were fixing to hit the ground and you remember that verse, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you say, Lord, save me. Do you think you will not hit the ground anymore? No, God is not talking about falling out of airplanes. What God is talking about is saving us from our sins, changing our life where old things pass away, all things become new, and we become a new creation. We become a child of God. And once we sincerely ask for that salvation, we get it. And uh, I, I believe that, like I said, the gospel has been changed and watered down in this easy believism. And lost people are just not getting saved. Uh, we talk about the world condition. And, and the, uh, we, the Democrats, the government, and everything, the homosexuals, and all that's going on. The reason why all this is happening is because people are not getting saved. And they're not getting saved because we've got a different gospel that we've started showing, uh, giving out this easy believing stuff. And the church is ran as an entertainment place. Uh, I uh, would love to see us to repent on this here and our churches get back right. Amen. We get a true burden for souls and really care. But you know, even though the lost man 
may feel that no one cares for his soul. There is one that cares, amen. Jesus Christ cares. And he cares for soul. First Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.15 says, This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's why Christ came in the world. He came because he cared about souls. He came to save sinners. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He cares that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. Matthew 11.28, Jesus stretches out his arms and says, Come, come unto me all ye that labor and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus cares. Now, when Jesus comes into our hearts, one of the things that ought to produce in our lives is that we too become Christians, Christ-likeness, and start caring. Caring for souls of men. Uh, uh, caring for wherever we might find souls. And this happened. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said that Christ loved me and gave himself for me. And now the life that I live, the, the burden and the concern for souls, it's not me. But it's Christ that lives within me. The one that loves souls. And so we have this, this uh, uh, when Christ comes, we have a desire for souls. And we see it throughout the Bible. When somebody got saved, they immediately had a burden for souls. In John chapter 1, you'll see that when Andrew meets Peter, I mean, Jesus walking on the shoreline. He meets Andrew there at his fishing boat. And uh, he, he talks to him. And Andrew gets saved. And the Bible says he First, go and find his brother Simon Peter and brought him to Jesus. Now, uh, it may be that he first, uh, before he did anything else, he went and found Peter. But also that first, you, you, you can't have a first without having a second, a third, right? And so that means he didn't stop at Peter. He first found his brother, but then he found somebody else and so on. He had a great burden for souls. And then you read a little bit later in that chapter, in John chapter 1, you see that Andrew gets saved. And he goes right away, runs off and finds Nathan now, says, Come, uh, we found the Messiah. And he brings Nathan now to him. Uh, you keep reading and you get over John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. She goes to Jacob's well to get water. She's got water pots in her hand. She goes there to get her some water. She meets Jesus at the well. Jesus begins to talk to her and she gets saved. And the Bible says after she got saved, she left her water pot, ran down to the city and began to tell men about Jesus. And she brought them to Jesus. And, and this happens over and over throughout the Bible. When somebody gets saved, the first thing they want to do is they have a burden for souls and tell people about Jesus Christ. Um, there's a, a, a story of the New Testament where Jesus heals a man. And after he heals him, he tells him, go and don't tell nobody. You remember reading that? Now, this healing is a picture of salvation. And he says, don't tell nobody. But the next verse says he went out and told everybody. Now, I believe that is recorded in our Bible for us to see. That even if you are commanded not to tell people about Jesus, that is a command you could not keep. Something happens when Christ comes into your heart. You want to tell people about Christ. You want to see people get saved. You have a burden. And then, not only are the lost man concerned about that no man cares for his soul, but then there are the saved people are crying out today. That no man cares for their soul. The unsaved man. But the saved man. Uh, it is really unbelievable what's happened today. As I see. I, I know at least five to six Christians. That I knew. That has committed suicide. That are hurting and suffering. Uh, I, I, uh, I hear. Uh, I was just called a, a brother over in Alabama. I wanted to meet up with him. I met him some uh, years ago. And I called him and told him that. I'm in town, and I one of it, and he was telling me, uh, and he almost like he's crying on the phone. Said, "Oh, brother, I, 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 it seems like everybody turned against me. I had these problems. I backslid, and, and 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 I messed my life up. And I just need some fellowship. I need somebody. And he just like begging me to come see him now. That he need. And I'm thinking, isn't there other Christians in the world 
in his environment and he talked like and uh, there are Christians that are hurting there are several do you know that there used to be a time when you did not come to church people notice where's sister so and, -so? and they would just assume if you're not in church you're sick so they went home and cooked up some meals and took some pot of food and they went over to your house because they expect you wouldn't be able to cook today if that happened I'd be kind of embarrassed if you showed up with some food with somebody that didn't come to church but there used to be a time that we was concerned and we cared for each other uh, but it's it, it's a sad situation today because uh, we come to church to play games and enjoy ourselves and have time and we're not really concerned about the others in our church and the problems I remember years ago uh, we had when I was stationed in North Carolina and the Marines and our, our church there the uh, one of the gunny sergeant went to came, he was our uh, song leader he sing pretty good he singed a special and I went over just complimenting him after the service and uh, I, I told him well that was good this morning and it seemed like he just glowed I was surprised like it was like he didn't have a friend nobody complimented him nobody said anything and it just made a big effect and you know uh, there ought to be a time that, uh, uh, in our lives now as Christians that we enjoy to be a blessing to others to help people and to reach out to them uh, but you know even though the Christian may feel that no one cares for his soul there is one that cares Jesus cares Hebrews 13 5 says let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such thing as you have for he has said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee Jesus is always there no matter what may happen and others may forsake Christ is there uh, John 15 12 said this is my commandment that you love one another even as I have loved you John 15 17 these things I command you that you love one another first John 4 7 beloved let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that love us is born of God and knoweth God John 4 11 beloved if God so love us we are to also love one another you know as a missionary and, and we all the Baptists uh, have y'all not noticed there's a difference in uh, uh, what we believe and what we think and what we teach uh, uh, across and I'm traveling all kinds of different Baptists and, 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 and you know I have to be careful what I say and what I might tell them that I believe because they won't like me they'll get mad at me and get angry and I'm thinking that it ought to be there to love me amen we need to love one another we're not going to all be on the same page in everything but we're supposed to love. There ought to be a love. And that's what we ought to be known about above everything else. Uh, we may have some other things we're wrong on. But we ought to be right on this thing about love. Um, John, 1 John 4, 12 says, No man has seen God at any time. And if we love one another, God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. And so we're to love. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another that's how we're going to identify christians how are we going to know if somebody's saved because he loved the world cannot love the world self-centered and selfish but one of the things aren't stick out above everything else in the church but they are not not be church fights and splits running preachers off it's really sad what is happening here you know i go to a church and uh, I'm at that church, and then three years later, I come back to that church. They've already had three pastors since I've been there last. Then ran him off. The church done split it, and the fighting going on. And what do they fight over? Somebody wants their way. Somebody wants. The, I was a church in Texas. I was with them for a, a little while and visit them and knew the pastor and stuff. And the pastor's wife, they lived down in Houston, and they were. He had. He was a contractor. Had made a lot of good money. They lived in a beautiful home. Had a big swimming pool out back. And but he had stopped his job. Went up to the little country. Took a little country church and wanted to be a pastor and, and preach. He was a good preacher. But his wife longed to get back in in Sodom. She wanted back down there in that where that swimming pool and that nice house. And so what he did, he talked the church in building a parsonage, real nice, to please his wife. And we'll build a nice parsonage. She'll have a house that she can be satisfied with. And she'll stay there. And so they, they started building. But the other ladies came in. And they wanted to know there what color the walls were supposed to be. What color the, the curtain's supposed to be. 
And they fussed and fight with the pastor's wife. And he ended up getting out of the ministry. Had to go back down to Houston and start back his contract business. And, uh, and I thought how sad it was that we fight over what we want. But there ought to be some love. And we ought to be known for our love and care for one another. There is the lost man feels that no man cares for his soul. The saved man is crying out that no man cares for his soul. And then lastly, there's children that are crying out, feeling that no man care for my soul. And, and it is really unbelievable what's happening in the world. I, I got the information off the internet that said there's 1.8 million children living on the streets in the Philippines. I, I took my camera and went down to the streets and saw some of the pictures, taking pictures of children, little small children, laid on cardboard boxes. You saw the girl, maybe you might have missed it, there's a girl that had a plastic bag around her face breathe in. That's glue in there. She's sniffing glue to try to kill the hunger pains and the, and, and, and the, and the problems she has and the molesting that she's going. And child molestation is unbelievable. The, the night before I left to make this trip, a, uh, Annalisa uh, was contacted by uh, social workers, brought us a little child, three-year-old girl, with the grandmother. The grandmother had contacted the social worker. She was concerned that the father had raped the little three-year-old. And the mother was involved in it too. And so the mother and the father had been arrested and put in jail. And they took the doctor, the little girl, to have a medical exam and found out they were uh, uh, bruises and penetration and, and, and just unbelievable. Three-year-old being raped by his own father. And then that we've had problems with girls uh, that had been came to the home that uh, their own father was selling them out, pimping them out for sex and stuff to uh, buddies and friends of theirs. And, uh, and just demonic. I believe there is a demonic satanic attack upon children today around the world. Uh, children going into school here in America, shooting their classmates. You know, something's r bad wrong when a child, a little small kid, go in there and start killing people. And, or uh, I hear reports where a child goes into the bedroom and kills both of their parents. And, uh, and, and all kinds of demonic stuff is going on. You know, I believe that Jesus loves the little children in a very special way. And I believe Satan hates that which God loves. And he hates in proportion as God loves. The things that God loves the most, Satan hates the most. And, and if it's true that God loves the children in a very special way, then we ought to be able to clearly see a demonic hatred of the devil towards children. Pedophile. I was just reading, just recently uh, on the internet, I saw uh, two uh, homosexuals that had adopted a little child. And they were teaching that child to be the opposite sex, dressed them all up, and and uh, they were interviewing the child, and the child was telling how it was happy being this other sex. And I was thinking how sick and demonic we are living in. And I believe that children are crying out that no man care for their souls. Uh, we had a uh, incident some years ago that. Uh, I, uh, I was out in California at a church, and uh, the pastor walked me out to the parking lot after the, the, I gave the presentation, and he told me, while I'm getting in the car, I said, Brother Fulford, we're not going to support your ministry. We're not interested in uh, children ministry. We only believe in evangelizing, church planning, winning souls. And, uh, I, and I thought about how that, you know, we have a lot of uh, outreaches trying to win souls. And I don't understand how he thinks that we can go down the street and pass out tracts and preach and see a little child laying on the street and just step over him and just keep on passing out tracts. And uh, I believe that if you love souls, you're going to love people also. And, and I believe your heart will go out. Uh, Jesus said, and how is it that you can... Uh, uh, you say you love God, but you don't love your brother. How can, you're not seeing God, but you can't love the ones you see. And I think we could take that same principle and say, how can it you can be burdened for a soul to go to hell? You've never seen hell. You've never seen that soul. But you don't have no concern, no burden for the person that you actually see living on the streets. But though the child may feel that no man cares for his soul, there is one that cares. Jesus cares. Mark 10, 13, it says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much 
displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. These are preachers. Preachers, the disciples that was right with Jesus, they try to hinder the children coming to Jesus. And I think we have it today. Uh, we had a, a pretty good nice church in uh, Yuma, Arizona that was supporting us some years ago. And uh, I, I don't know, I had this idea that uh, the children's home, I separated it from our church uh, uh, as far as uh, identifying because I want the children home, the children to learn how to work. I think the brother over here mentioned that earlier. They need to learn to work. And I want the children to work so we have a, a, a hog farm, we have a garden, we have some goats, and we have some ducks and different things. And they're out there working. And then we sell some stuff as we're able to. The kids can sell things they raise. I didn't want the church doing that. I don't want the church selling and raising things. So I kind of try to make a distinction. And in order to make it clear that it was not the church, I took the name Baptist out of the name of the children's home. It is Subic Bay Children's Home. And then our church is named Subic Bay Baptist Church. But because I took the word Baptist out of the name of the children's home, that church that was supporting us for many years, they, he wrote me to him, we're not supporting you. Remove the word Baptist. Uh, we're not taking care of the children. We're not going to help them no more. And I thought, did we really even care about the children to begin with? You know, if that's going to be... And, and not only that, uh, and of course, uh, even before I really made the decision that we're going to come to the States quite often to fundraise and, and get our medical, uh, I came here because uh, I had a, 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 my oldest son was killed here in Pensacola by a drunk driver. And I had to come here to the funeral. Then uh, my mother died down in Texas uh, a few months later, and I came over for that. And because I came uh, to the States twice within two years period, the church in uh, Tennessee, a large church, wrote me a letter and said, but if we're not supporting you no more, you come to the States too often. And, and so they stopped the support of the children because of that. And you know, the children are still there. The children's home's still there, whether I'm here or not. They're still, but, uh, and I think that we look for little things to try to get out of that, but we wouldn't be doing that if we really had a burden and love and concern for that child. And we see that Jesus cared. Uh, Psalms 27, 10 says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You know, uh, I used that verse on a prayer, a prayer letter one time on my letterhead when my one of my sons was there in the Philippines with me uh, years ago. And we had an old manual typewriter that he was typing my prayer letters out with. And uh, he, he typed it out. And when I read it, he had the verse different from what I had written it down. And I thought, oh, he's going to have to type this whole thing over again. But I looked at the Bible, and I found he was right, and I was wrong. And I said, well, that's great. And I liked the way the Bible had it better than the way I put it. I had said, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me in. But it doesn't say he, he will take me in. It said he'll take me up. He'll take me up in his arms. He'll love me. And Christ loves the children. And then, uh, as Christians, when Christ comes into our lives then we're going to truly start caring about the children. John, James 1, verse 27. Pure religion, an undefiable for God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Pure religion is to visit the fathers. You see, pure religion is that when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he took the children up in his arm. He loved them. He cared for them. Jesus is not here today as he was before walking around in his body. But he is here. And he is here in a body. That body is the church. And if Christ is going to take the children up in his arms, he's going to have to do it with that body. And that's why it says pure religion and undefiled for God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless as Christ had done. We're to love. And I... I I was telling the pastor earlier that uh, this is going to be the first time, I, this first church service I had uh, since I've been here. We just flew in the other night, and we're going to head out to New England. And I'm on, uh, so I tried that out on y'all first, and hopefully, uh, maybe if uh, somebody got saved this morning, so the benches all covered with people, I can feel more comfortable about preaching it next time. Okay, but uh, I hope that uh, something was said that would be a blessing to you. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for that love. We thank you for Jesus. And God, I pray that, Lord, that you will help us as Christians to truly care, to have a great burden for souls, a love for other Christians, and to truly be concerned about the conditions of the children. And God, we pray that we'll not only uh, be in word, but our actions will indicate it. And God, we thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to give you one verse. I just can't hold back. <laughs> Hebrews 13. Look at verse 17. Hebrews 13, 17. He says, um, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they which must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I'm not making a point about somebody being over you. What I'm making a point about is everybody should be watching for somebody's soul. That's a Christian's job, is to be watching for somebody. And maybe you've got four or five people you've got to watch out for. I pity you. <laughs> but pick at least one person that you can be responsible for their soul, because God's going to, he knows who he picked out for you to be over. And when we get to heaven, we've got to give account for it.